Let me give you two illustrations of what I mean. The mess was projected for the automotive industry in 1960. It was done under, actually under the sponsorship of Ford. The way it was done was as follows. For, for reasons which are not important, we took the year 2000 as a base. And from the Bureau of the Census, we found out what was the expected population in the United States in the year 2000. And we asked the Census Bureau to tell us how many of those people would be old enough to drive. That took a large computer program because they had to do it state by state using different driving laws, but we assumed the laws did not change. And we finally got the number of people in the year 2000 that would be able to drive if everything kept going the way it was. Next question was how many automobiles would there be per person who's old enough to drive? Now the American Institute of Automotive Manufacturers publishes annual figures on cars per capita that was plotted from 1920 to 1960 and projected out to the year 2000. It was an easy projection. It turned out to be 1.54 automobiles for every person old enough to drive. Now that's a hell of a lot of automobiles. Fortunately, the principal transportation consultant in the United States at the time, a man by the name of Voorhees, had published an article just a few months earlier saying that the maximum number of automobiles in any society would tolerate is one per driver. So we rounded it off to one. <laughs> that meant now we knew the number of people old enough to drive in the United States, that would be equal to the number of cars. Now next question, how many miles a year will be driven per car? Well, the American Institute of Petroleum publishes annual figures, so we plotted it, projected it out, and it went up from 11,800 to 13,200 miles a year per car. Next question was, how many miles will be in cities and how many between cities? The Highway Research Board of the Federal Government publishes annual figures on that. We plotted it, projected it out, it's turned out 62% would be driven within cities. So 62% times 13,200 times the number of drivers gave us the total automobile miles per year in urban USA in the year 2000. Now that turned out to be more miles than could be accommodated in current streets and highways. There was no way. So in order to maintain a 1960 level of congestion, we would have to add additional streets and highways. How many? Well, that was a very difficult problem. We really didn't know how to solve that, so we turned it over to our students. <laughs> and, uh, they set up a large computer simulation, and they found the answer. It would take 11,800 additional lane miles of streets and highways. How much is it going to cost to build it? Well, the Highway Research Board publishes annual figures on the cost per lane mile. We projected that out, took the average and so on and figured it out. It was going to cost $18.4 billion a year to build roads and highways to maintain a 1960 level of congestion out to the year 2000 if nothing changed in the company's behavior. Now, $18.4 billion doesn't sound like a big number today. But in 1960, the largest amount the federal government had ever spent on all forms of urban transportation put together was $1.4 billion a year. And therefore, Ford was implicitly assuming the federal government was going to spend more than 12 times as much as the maximum amount it had ever spent and do it every year for the next 40 years on building roads and highways. That's not a very realistic assumption, but that's not the mess. The mess is what would happen if they did it. If the government spent that money for 40 years, by the year 2000, 117% of the city's surface would be covered with streets and highways. <laughs> That's the mess. It can't happen. The mess is always something that can't happen. Something is going to prevent it from happening. What? Well, we don't know, but that's the point. Because you can identify at least five different things that can happen. You can outlaw the use of the automobile. You can change the design of the city so it doesn't require as much use of the automobile. You can change the design of the automobile so it doesn't require as much use of streets, and on and on. The fact is that once you know this, you can now direct your planning to make the alternative that's most favorable to you the one that comes out. We pointed this out to Ford, but Ford didn't believe any of it, because in 1960, one half of one percent of the cars sold in the United States were foreign made. 
and uh, they said the United States would never tolerate a smaller than a six-passenger car. By the way, I made a bet with the Vice President of Finance of Ford at that time that within 25 years, more than half the cars sold in the United States would be made abroad, and I won that bet. They couldn't see that it was inevitable that something was going to have to happen. For example, we said one possibility is to outlaw the use of the automobile. He said, you're crazy. We can't do that. The automobile's too important. Is, it, is that true? Well, we've outlawed the use of the automobile all over the place. I was giving some examples today. In Mexico, if your license plate ends in a one or two, you can't drive on Monday. If it ends in a three and a four, you can't drive on Tuesday. Five or six, you can't drive on Wednesday, and so on. That's outlawing the use of the automobile. They're now about to go to two days instead of one. In Rome, they've cordoned off a section in the center of the city where you can't drive an automobile at all. In Philadelphia, the main shopping street is closed from 7 in the morning to 7 in the night. You can't drive on it. You can only walk on it or use a bus or taxi. Restrictive use of the automobile is a common way of trying to reduce congestion, but we're not succeeding. There was a recent tie-up in Mexico City that involved 42,000 automobiles for 24 hours. And over, a, I can't remember the exact number now, but it was close to two dozen people died because they couldn't get medical aid to them in the middle of this tie-up. Congestion is a major problem, and something has to be done if the automotive industry is going to continue to grow. Now, we pointed out the two things that we thought would most likely do it was a redesign of the city, and the other was a redesign of the automobile. And since Ford had no interest in redesigning the city, we got a foundation to support a study of this. And we produced the design of the city uh, of any size from scratch that would reduce the amount of urbanized, mechanized transportation by 87%. And that meant that the current amount of streets and highways would take care of automotive traffic well into the next century without another single mile being built. Now, obviously, Ford had no interest in that. Nobody did. It was a purely academic exercise. But that doesn't frustrate an academic. <laughs> I mean, we frequently do things that are useless. There's always one thing you can do with anything, no matter how useless it is. What is it? Publish it. <laughs> so we published it. And lo and behold, that city exists today. There is a city of two million built in Mexico. It's called Cuauhtlan Iscali. It's about 30 miles in the northeast of Mexico City, and there's hardly a moving vehicle within. Because the chief city planner, Roque Gonzalez, read that article. And when asked to develop a new city to take the overflow from Mexico City, he used it. It exists. Then we redesigned the automobile. I wish there were time to tell you about all the details of that design, because every American is a frustrated automobile designer. And we came up with an urban automobile, only for use within the city, five days a week, from 7 in the morning to 7 at night. It was a two-passenger car, with the passengers riding back to back, in a car that could be driven from either end, with the motor in the middle. It went 85 miles to the gallon, cost about $3,000, and was non-polluting and had all kinds of additional properties that people liked. We had a drive-it-yourself taxi cab that was coin-operated. And when all this design was done, Ford had no interest, so we published it. <laughs> two cities picked it up. There are two cities that have drive-it-yourself coin-operated taxi cabs, one in France and one in Holland today. But most important, after more than 20 years, it's almost 30 years, this year, Renault came out with a two-passenger urban automobile. It is out. I just saw it two weeks ago in Portugal, where they had it on display. The back orders are so large that Mercedes and BMW couldn't resist and announced they will have a competitive vehicle out within the year. The beginning is coming. See, the importance of formulating the mess, of seeing the whole, is incredible. Now, the automotive industry foolishly ignored it, but let me give you a case that didn't. In 1973, we began work with the Federal Reserve Bank when the dean of the Wharton School left the Wharton School to become president of the fourth district of the bank, which is the district headquartered in Cleveland that serves Ohio, Kentucky, and western Pennsylvania. His name was Dr. Willis Wind. He was a close personal friend. 
So shortly after he took the job, he called me one day. He said, I'd like you to come out, and I think we need some help. So I went on out to see him, and I sat down. I said, Willis, I'd love to help you, but I don't know a damn thing about banking. I never worked in a bank. I didn't take a course in finance. You know, I'm originally an architect. What the hell do I know about banking? And he said, uh, you don't have to worry about that. He said, we've had a lot of consultants, and they haven't done us any good. So if the people who know something about banking can't do us any good, maybe the people who don't can. I said, well, what do you do? He said, we control the money supply. I said, no, 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 that's the result. What do you actually do? When you look at people in the bank, what are they doing? He looked at me and said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, well, let's find out. So he agreed, and we did a time study, an old-fashioned time study. 65% of the man hours in the bank were spent clearing checks. That's what they do, clearing checks. So we got curious. We went back to 1946, the end of World War II and plotted the number of checks cleared per year by the Federal Reserve Bank up to 1973. It was an exponential curve. Now, exponential is a fancy statistical term, which means that the rate of increase in the number of checks was increasing. So every year, the increase was larger than the previous years, and that's an exponential curve. We projected it out. We picked a convenient time, 1985. We then studied the number of checks a check clearer could clear in a day, and that was a constant. The amount of space required to accommodate a check clearer. And then we calculated the number of check clearers and the amount of space required to clear the checks in 1985. And it turned out if every office building in the United States was used to house check clearers, there still would not be enough space for them. More importantly, by the year 2000, there was going to be more people clearing checks in the United States than there were people. <laughs> no, that clearly couldn't happen. But the bank took it seriously, and the net result is something you use every day. That's where the electronic funds transfer system came. It was a system deliberately designed to reduce the number of checks that are written from what it would be did the system not exist? And it's moving very rapidly towards its ultimate objective, which is a cashless society. Cash is an incredibly inefficient way of transmitting information about resources which you have available for use. Let me take one last consequence of system thinking. We can go on for hours on this, but I'll take just one more. One of the things you're taught in school and you practice rigidly is there are production problems. There are marketing problems, there are financial problems, there are personnel problems, there are R&D problems, logistics problems, political problems, social problems, religious problems, health problems, educational problems, and so on, right? Wrong. There is absolutely no such things. There ain't no such thing as a production problem or a marketing problem or a financial problem. That's a myth perpetuated by the educational system. The adjective in front of the word problem tells you something, but it doesn't tell you one damn thing about a problem. Let me tell you what it does tell you by a story. 